Okay, so our first speaker is Ranislav, and he will uh, discuss the paper which deals with the yes overfitting problem. Go ahead, uh, Ranislav. Yeah, the the paper today I wanted to discuss is the reconciling modern machine learning and the classical bias variance trade-offs, and we shall see what's the difference between this modern view and what was the classical view on this topic. Basically, this bias variance trade-off is closely related to overfitting. I mean, the, the central problem of uh, machine learning. So let's see first, uh, what's this actually, the bias variance trade-off and bias variance, bias variance decomposition. So first, uh, let's start. We have some data set D, which is drawn for some distribution. And of course, on that data set, we want to perform uh, we want to perform some machine learning algorithm A. In our case, we'll speak about neural networks, but it's not big difference in general for any algorithm. Uh, so if we apply this machine learning algorithm, we'll get uh, this hypothesis D. This hypothesis H, which depends on D, but in neural networks, it will also depend on this uh, data which represents the non-deterministicity of the stochastic gradient descent we are using. So before I uh, derive this formula for the bias variance decomposition, let's see first what are the basic uh, components of that decomposition and what we are going to, to need. Uh, so first, given some x, of course, in some cases, uh, x may not have the the unique label and uh, therefore it makes sense to define this the expected label of uh, x so, so, so x is like input and y is output yes uh, yes all right gotcha. yes uh, y is the the label here and so we like i said we define this expected expected label given x mm -hmm. uh, further what we can also here define, we can define the expected classifier given this data set D. Like I said, because it depends on, on this large data, on the stochastic gradient ascent, it makes sense to define this expected, like the average classifier on D. Uh, now, when we have this HD data, this classifier, uh, we define the expected test error, but this is given uh, this classifier HD data, and of course we define it the usual way. But we are not uh, done yet. Uh, we are not done yet here because we want to see what is the expected error, but given the learning algorithm algorithm A. So here the expected classifier given A would be the expectation over uh, these data sets a given a and so now what we actually are interested in is the expected test error given machine learning algorithm so again usual this integral i mean just basically it's mathematical expression but what we truly interested in is this these expressions here so now it, it can be mathematically derived then this uh, expression on the left hand side can be decomposed into these three particulars expression on the right side. And each of these expressions has uh, uh, has unique name and unique uh, features here. The first term it's called variance, the second term is called noise, and the third term is called bias squared. So basically, this variance, of course, it has the its basic variance shape form. And what it actually measures here? Well, basically, in general, it measures how our machine learning algorithm is uh, sensitive to a uh, small fluctuations. For example, if we have a high variance, what that would mean? That would mean that uh, maybe we modeled uh, our maybe we modeled our hypothesis on this data set, but we also included uh, random noise in that uh, modeling. 
so it will depend a lot on on those small fluctuations the second term is basically there is nothing we can do about it it's just the noise in the data and the third term it's called the bias squared and basically bias for example if you have a large bias that means that we actually didn't capture the true relation between our x's and our y's i mean between features and the the labels associated with those features and all these terms will in general add to this total error of our of our algorithm so so uh, so overfitting is the last term is that your model doesn't quite produce what uh your data tell you the labeling tells you right you mean if it's small well i mean i mean uh yeah if it's small then there is no overfitting if there is uh large then it's larger of you so la last term is uh, is where your uh algorithm that's what overfitting is or or, or not i mean yes basically yeah. okay. like i said if it's small then what that means that means that we fitted uh, fitted well this uh, data and the first term is just a variance in 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 uh, uh different like runs of your say stochastic gradient descent right so you may end up at different uh solutions and so th there'll be there'll be variance there um yes, so, yes. okay gotcha uh, so let's see now when we introduce this bias variance decomposition let's see what basically means this bias variance trade-offs I mean, what was believed? That's, this is the, the classical view still. Well, it was believed that if we want a small bias, if we want to fit uh, data on our data set we are using to produce our hypothesis, the variance must go up and vice versa. And that's why uh, this total error will have this, uh, this U-shaped curve. And the whole story about this uh, classical view was to find the, that sweet spot where mm. basically it will perform well on our test set. Oh, I mean, first on a training set, of course, but then also what's the point if it not performs well in general? So that was the classical point of view. Okay, and then, then, then first off, I was wrong, right? So then it's the first term that gives you the refitting. Uh, yeah, I mean, so, so the last term eventually with more complexity uh, dies, out, dies out, right? So yeah, you uh, yeah that... the last term basically, yeah, in some sense measures how we fitted well on our training. On average, set. right? On average, right? And and the yes, variance... yes, on average. Okay. Yes. Mm -hmm. And so this is this is from the first paper which they introduced uh, this term, the bias variance radius. Like I said, it says the price to pay for achieving low bias is high variance. And still we're in this classical classical regime of machine learning. And like I said, here we want to try to find this uh, sweet spot where the x-axis actually represents the capacity of H and on the y-axis <clears throat> is plotted the risk. So that capacity in general we have several complexities of uh, of uh, machine learning algorithm for example the number of parameters also we may say that it is more complex with respect to epochs if we run it uh, more epochs but here in this paper it was focused on this uh, number of parameters if we increase number of parameters the training risk as we see here as expected it will go down but this test risk eventually it will start go down but eventually it will start rising and basically that's that's the overfitting regime and so the whole point was to find that sweet spot but a couple of years ago when this paper was published they actually tried to reconcile uh, they made uh, new experiments which didn't really fit well in this picture of the classical u-shaped curve so how they managed let's say managed to to reconcile this uh, classical view and modern view 
they introduced uh, this double descent curve. So basically what this double descent curve means. Uh, on the left side, on the left hand side, we have this classical view. This is the left part of this picture. And on the right side, this is uh, somewhat new. Uh, where we have this interpolation threshold, we see what that means. Uh, after we pass this interpolation threshold, uh, the, uh, the, the test risk will eventually start to go again, to go down. And this interpolation threshold, for example, in, uh, in regression model, for example, if we want to fit, I don't know, 100 points, and we are working with uh, 100 parameters, somewhat like that, in that, in the neighborhood of that, of, of that number, well, basically, we're actually not fitting anymore. We are more like interpolating those points. But what was believed, we are still in the classical regime. What was believed, it was if we interpolate those points, it won't, it won't perform very well on our unseen data, unseen data. But then the authors of this paper, what actually they did, they continued to, to increase the number of parameters. even even uh, like I said, if we have 100 points, they continue to increase it, like 1,000, 10,000 points and 10,000 parameters and so on and so on. And what they saw, uh, they, they saw that actually it will perform again better than this classical regime. It will start to go down and even in some cases, it will go down this uh, test risk. It will go down down below our sweet spot in our cl classical regime. And so, so Krenislav, oh, oh, this was done again for the horizontal direction, not to be time, but to be complexity, yes. like the size of neural. Have they uh, yes. uh, have they got similar results if if uh, you know you run longer or, or not? I mean, here they run, like I said, a couple of magnitudes uh, more than this interpolation threshold. No, example, my question meaning like, can you like show, for example, that you do not change the number of neurons or number of trainable variables, uh, you run it. Now, first it, it underfits, then it overfits, and then it goes into this uh, interpo inter, you know, interpolating regime. Did, did, it, did it happen? Like without changing the number of trainable parameters, only by varying the time, only by just running it longer. Uh, no, in this paper, they haven't they, been able to see that. No, no. Yeah. There's an, another paper on that I'll mention it later, but here they only mm -hmm. increase the number of uh, parameters in the neural network mm -hmm. when they saw this. So basically, what happens here? Here is one example. If you want, I don't know how many we have. I think we have 10, uh, 10 train points here. So basically, if we have like uh, 40 of these ReLU features, we see how it will interpolate those points. But we see those uh, peaks. I mean, it's, it's not that smooth, and it won't perform that well on our unseen data. But again, if we increase the number of these features, we see we actually achieve this smoothness, smoothness among those uh, points. And this other curve has a lot better chance to perform well on our unseen data than the previous one. So basically, here, is, here are their experiments. So basically, they tried uh, their experiments on the MNIS data set with, uh, I think, 4, 000, uh, 4,000 samples. And here we see on the x-axis the number of uh, parameters there in the neural network. What did I notice here? This interpolation threshold will be achieved uh, not on the number of uh, samples, but on the number of samples times 10. Because what is 10 in the MNIST data set? Well, it's basically the number of classes there. 
So basically here they achieved it, their interpolation threshold. And after that, again, they saw this decline in the, in the test uh, error. Uh, okay, I want, also wanted to share to share a video about uh, how this works when we can uh, track simultaneously the, the loss and the increment in the number of uh, neurons. Okay, so basically, as we saw, this is just I was uh, talking about. And uh, as you mentioned, the uh, if we want to achieve a complexity in terms of time, like the number of epochs and so on, uh, this is the paper. Let me just find it. Yeah, this paper I would recommend uh, uh, for reading. It's also recent from the previous year. Mm -hmm. That's it for this presentation. Okay, and do they have uh, any analytical uh, explanation for that second regime where, you know, I, I see the numerics when, as you increase the width of the network, uh, now at some point it starts to perform better, but have, have they done any analytics showing that? No, no. Basically, no. basically this is, there is no math in this paper. It's right. more like a like empirical results here. Mm -hmm. But of course, it's worth uh, exploring this. Can I ask a question? Of course, anyone can ask yeah. a question. Okay, uh, so th this paper to me kind of seems related to the one that we saw on infinitely wide neural networks. Mm -hmm. uh, because as we saw, uh, wide neural networks, they degenerate to a linear model mm -hmm. in the limit of like infinite width. So it seems like uh, when you increase the complexity, uh, you increase the you you increase the by you increase the variance. But at some point, or no, or should we say that we increase the bias? No, no, the bias decreases because you increase the complexity. But then, at one point, it, it it's as if it turns the other way, right? Like it's as if the effective bias decreases. Do yeah, you know it, starts, I mean? it starts being linear, you mean, right? At some point. Yeah, yeah, it starts closer, with the linear. Closer, like, like the high, uh, higher order terms in this interpolation. But, yeah, it starts it starts with a linear model and then like you, it's more and more and more and more complex and then somehow it, it starts going the other okay. way around. Maybe those, those are related, yeah. So maybe it's related to that. Good point. The questions? All right, there is one. Uh, well, Fikra, just speak up. <clears throat> oh, thank you. Uh, it's not a question, but um, this paper I just shared um, also shows mathematically why over parameterization is a, a necessary component uh, in some uh, uh, modeling problems. And if you want some a smooth uh, data interpolation, you're gonna need uh, um, a factor of um, 
uh, over parameterization as given in some of the examples in this paper. Well, what is the paper? Can you read the title? A uh, universal law of uh, robustness via isogrammetry. Okay. It's in the chat. Oh, <laughs> thanks. Sure. I have a quick question. So oh. you you mentioned uh, that they were measuring the network parameter or the network size in terms of parameters as a factor of the training data set. Did I understand that correctly? Or is that completely wrong? Uh, I mean... Uh... So like the threshold where it starts again decreasing in the over-parameterized uh, regime? Yeah. Yeah, is that like a, is that a factor of the training data set size? So is that going to shift yes, yes. based on the training data set size? Yes, uh, they trained on the four four thousand uh, uh, training uh, samples. No, but, but I think like, Vladimir is asking if this uh, point will shift if you change yeah. uh, that data size, and of yeah, course, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Of course it will, right? Yeah, basically they noticed, like I said, the, the number of samples times the number of classes. Basically that's where they achieve this uh, threshold interpolating. Okay, yeah, because then I, w I wonder if they uh, discussed the issue of like, if you want to have, if your test data is like the real world, is there like some sort of optimal training data set size? So you know how big your model has to be to like work on the real world and not just, you know, a test data set that's like a toy, you know, subset. But what do you mean by the, the real world is when you have, can generate like infinite number of data points, right? Yeah, I guess. And, I guess. and, and, and then and they're never repeated. So, so then then effectively your size is infinite uh, for, for the... Well, I, I, I guess I'm assuming if like the distribution doesn't change yeah, yeah, yeah. This is exactly what uh, Franislav had. You had distribution doesn't. Yeah, change, okay. But then you generate the number of data points, but they, you never repeat them. You never like look twice at the same data point. So, so, then, so then we need like an infinite size network then to like really. Yeah, so that, that, the two infinities here, right? The infinity that has to do with the number of data points and infinity that has to do with the, uh, well, with the complexity. But I think in this limit, this threshold will just be pushed to infinity to the right. And then you, you, you are never in that regime, in this modern regime. Right? Yeah, because that what okay. happens. If you increase the number of data points, this threshold is pushed further, further to the right. Um, Franislav, is this right? Yes, yes. So, so then you, yeah, so if you take it to infinity, it just push to the right. And then you, uh, you know, overfitting is no longer, I guess, an issue. I mean, yeah. I guess you could also like predict how how many samples your whatever application is is gonna like see. So right, it's but, but are you, are you gonna see it twice? Big, I mean, so. I think maybe the question is, are you gonna look at it twice, right? So, uh, yeah, what is it a single epoch you're just going through? <laughs> there will be many epochs. Because uh, uh, like in the case of like say Tesla driving, mm -hmm. uh, they just keep saying that we need more edge cases, more data. Uh -huh. But like it doesn't seem like they know like how much exactly data you need, and this could be kind of like maybe not a direct answer, but like a, a hint at like how how much training data you actually need to have the actual car driving with no issues. Right. Well, but but, but that that's a, a question about the sweet spot. I think I, I think in the case of, of Tesla, when you have the underlying probability distribution, uh, and you keep. Um, or, or, or do you mean that uh, how much data you need to have and then still uh, go over that data set many times for training? Maybe that's what you mean. Well, well, that... it, well here it's about in terms of training data set size and how well it generalizes to unseen data. Right. So if, if the Tesla car is seeing unseen data, obviously, like when it's driving, Mm -hmm. um, the question is how much training data do you need to train it on to like ensure that it's going to have some performance in the real world. Right. So, so, so I, I think mean, they, yeah. they could probably predict or estimate how many samples. It's not going to be like a finite number of, you know, samples mm -hmm. that, or it's not going to be an infinite number of samples that the Tesla car is going to like perceive every year. Mm -hmm. But yeah, I'm just wondering if this is like a way to guarantee some sort of performance. 
Right. So I, I think maybe there are, there's there's uh, two answers to this, right? Where, where do you want to stop training in the sweet spot, or in and the on the on the tail on the right? Uh, so maybe if the sweet spot is already low enough and it gives you good performance, uh, then your uh, you know, size of the data set. Uh, can be arbitrarily large. It doesn't matter. Uh, you're not o o overfitting. But if if uh, you do see overfitting, then 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 you're right. Then you have to look for that other uh, minima uh, to get the real world effect of the real world distribution. Uh, so and that answer to the way you are depends on the actual size of the of the data set. So. Yeah, I think there, there is a calculation that can be done just to tell you where you are. So like, you know, your neural network is tr being trained, you know exactly how many uh, training data points, and then you know, okay, so you're on the left of this threshold or on the right, and then, then you would know what, what to do with it. Yeah, thanks. Yeah. yeah. Other questions, comments? All right. Thank you, Franslav. Thank you.